Okay, so those are my uh, disclosures. So as you know, chronic ischemic MR has this sort of typical uh, echo echocardiographic picture where you see the typical Siegel sign of uh, tenting from the anterior leaflet. You see left ventricular dilatation and dysfunction, and of course the regurgitant jet. As we all know, the uh, mitral valve is composed of four main components, the annulus, the leaflets, the chordae, and the papillary muscle, but also an important component that's often overlooked but is a, uh, a very important one for the mitral valve is the surrounding myocardium around the papillary uh, muscle. Functional mitral regurgitation um, is where you have normal uh, mitral valve leaflet appearance and morphology. Uh, but either pure annular dilatation, like it is for dilated cardiomyopathy, or leaflet restriction for ischemic MR. We all know the Carpentier classification system. I won't go over it, but the type 3B is the one that we're talking about where you have systolic restriction of uh, leaflet motion. Uh, there, the normal uh, mitral valve uh, function is pictured here where you have a balance between closing and, and uh, tethering forces on the mitral valve uh, leaflets. After an infarction occurs, you have a decreased closing force because the left ventricle is not contracting as, uh, um, as well as it was before the uh, MI. You have uh, displacement of the uh, posterior medial, usually posterior medial papillary muscle, but also sometimes the anterolateral papillary muscle. Uh, that results in uh, leaflet tethering and then distraction of the leaflets from each other which then results in MR, and then the MR can uh, induce uh, annular dilatation. Unless the patient has uh, atrial fibrillation, annular dilatation does not precede MR. It always follows MR. So ischemic mitral regurgitation, as we all know, is, de is associated with decreased long-term survival from studies of myocardial infarction and revascularization uh, trials. It is present in approximately 10% of the patients with coronary artery disease. 70% of congestive heart failure uh, is due to ischemic cardiomyopathy, and half of these patients have um, ischemic mitral regurgitation. And it's therefore been estimated that the incidence, at least in America, is 1.6 to 2.8 million. Uh, this is the SAVE trial. As you know, um, this shows a big difference for survival if you do have MR. And, and just important to stress, this is mild or moderate. This is not even uh, severe. Uh, sorry, so this is mild, moderate, or severe MR. This includes patients even with just mild. So mild also has an impact. We've all seen patients with similar infarcts on their echoes. They have the same infarct in the same area. They have the same region uh, wall, wall motion abnormality. They have the same left ventricular dilatation. This patient has, has MR. This patient doesn't. Why is that? Well, um, part of it is the fact that some people are able to grow their mitral valve leaflets with stress. So this is a sheep infarction model where they showed that in some sheep, when you get the infarction of the papillary muscle tip, you have increased stress on the chordae and on the leaflets, and the leaflets can grow, but not all sheep. And I think that this can apply also in humans. Some humans have some distensibility and growth capabilities for their mitral leaflets, others don't. Who are the ones that we operate on? They're always the ones that have the 26 or 28 size anterior leaflet. They're not the ones that have a 36 or a 38 size anterior leaflet like we often see from myxomatous disease. Also, these patients have decreased leaflet distensibility. So this is a uh, human study where they looked at these leaflets that have been uh, resected during surgery and then did some tensile uh, testing on them. And they found that patients that had functional mitral regurgitation had much less distensibility of the mitral uh, uh, valve leaflets compared to those that had normal or uh, degenerative MR. Approximately 50,000 operations on the mitral valve are performed per year in the United States, uh, mitral regurgitation in 80% of those patients. And of the mitral regurgitation patients, 70% are for degenerative and 30% are functional. 20% ischemic, 10% dilated cardiomyopathy. So when you get right down to the numbers, you realize we're actually treating a very small number of patients with functional mitral regurgitation. This is a, um, a slide that I borrowed from uh, my colleague and friend, Marty Leon, and uh, it's been estimated in the United States alone there are 4 million patients with MR 2 plus or more. Uh, de degenerative MR is 56%, functional MR is 44%, and 1.8 million people have 3 plus or more MR. So if you uh, look at the guidelines and interpret them strictly, you should come to the conclusion that there are 1.4 million patients that require uh, 
um, uh, uh, surgery for degenerative MR and 0 0.8 million that require surgery for functional MR. How many are we actually treating? Well, I already said to you before, 50,000. So there is a huge unmet need currently uh, for patients with mitral regurgitation. Uh, less so for degenerative MR, but it still exists. So we as surgeons are only seeing the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, these were the guidelines that were published in 2012, the European guidelines on mitral regurgitation. And for uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, if the patients had severe MR and had another reason to undergo surgery, most commonly cabbage, then it was a class 1C recommendation. For those that had moderate MR, uh, we, we classified it as a 2A uh, indication, and then a 2B indication in patients that had severe MR and uh, um, were symptomatic but did not have any revascularization uh, options. As you know, the principles for mitral repair for ischemic uh, MR is basically undersized annuloplasty. I share uh, Joe's um, uh, skepticism about this operation, the super undersized annuloplasty, I just do not think is a very good operation. Um, and I also tend to either size it to the size of the anterior leaflet or at the most one, one size uh, less. Um, when you look at Jerry Braun and, and uh, Robert, Robert Dion's uh, paper though, they uh, are very aggressive with their undersizing um, from Leiden and basically following uh, similar to the Steve Bowling uh, principle. And their results are very impressive. They have an operative mortality rate of 8%, a five-year survival rate of 71%, and a freedom from MR of 85% four years after surgery. Unfortunately, these results really haven't been duplicated anywhere else. What they did find, however, is that the, if the LV was markedly dilated, that is more than 6.5 centimeters, this was a marker of poor outcome, and these patients tended to either die or develop recurrent MR. Uh, their left ventricular and systolic uh, diameter that was the cutoff was 5.1 centimeters, but the diastolic diameter of 6.5 centimeters is the one that's most commonly referred to in the literature. This is a randomized trial. There's been a few randomized trials, and I'm just going to show you one of them. This is from Italy, where they uh, randomized patients with moderate uh, ischemic MR requiring coronary bypass surgery to undergo either coronary bypass surgery alone or coronary bypass plus mitral valve re uh, repair. This was 102 patients, and they had an overall hospital mortality of 3%, so those were very good results. Not surprisingly, they did not find any difference in survival up to five years postoperatively, but it was a very small uh, study and was not powered to detect a difference in survival. But they did find um, significantly improved reverse remodeling and much less regurgitation in patients that underwent a concomitant mitral valve repair. And they, these uh, uh, effects were all highly statistically significant. Important to notice, however, that the, this is a group of patients that were quite low, um, low risk from, our, from when you look at the literature compared to the uh, normal studies in the literature for patients with ischemic MR. These guys had small ventricles with rather preserved EF. So if you have a patient that has a 55 millimeter ventricle and a 45% EF and they've got moderate to severe MR, that's the type of patient I love to treat because I know that I'm going to have a successful operation. But that's the type of patient that probably has an anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that just can't, has no capacity to grow whatsoever, and that's why they have their MR. So the question is, should we perform concomitant mitral valve repair for patients with moderate ischemic MR? And I would answer, it depends. So there's a few factors that I like to take into consideration. These are those three randomized trials that I uh, referred to, and all three of them definitively uh, show that there is less uh, MR over time if you do a concomitant mitral valve repair. There, some of those studies show also improved uh, reverse remodeling, like I showed you. That's in the RIME study and in the Fatouche uh, Italian study, but that was not demonstrated in the CTSNet randomized trial. Uh, they all show some benefit on quality of life for concomitant mitral repair, but none of them show a survival benefit and neither have large retrospective uh, series. And this is the one uh, main reason why we do not get many of these patients sent to us as cardiac surgeons from our cardiology colleagues. They do not see an obvious benefit to surgery. One thing that, uh, some things that I do like to consider though when I have a patient that has moderate MR, needs a bypass operation, 
these are the things that tip me more towards doing a concomitant mitral repair. That is, if they're younger and therefore have a longer life expectancy. If the mitral valve looks more repairable, that is, less severe tethering. I'll get, uh, say some more about that in just a few minutes. If the LVEF is relatively preserved, so once the EF starts dropping below 25%, your, your uh, likelihood of having a successful repair uh, drops and the likelihood of the patient being able to survive the increased uh, 30 minutes of ischemic time also uh, drops. Another thing I look at is reversibility. And unfortunately, in the large CTS net trial, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, they did not uh, assess reversibility in all of the patients. But if I, if I do have a patient that has a large reversible, reversible defect in the lateral inferior wall, that's likely, it's likely that their mitral regurgitation will improve on its own. So I may uh, use that to decide whether or not to repair the valve. And then also less comorbidities, because if they have a bunch of comorbidities, renal failure, et cetera, then they may not tolerate that increased cardiopulmonary bypass time. So what are the limitations of the ring annuloplasty? As you all know, it does not prevent uh, this increased uh, tethering in all patients. You do have persistent tethering in a significant proportion. This is the slide that we've all seen a million times, showing a recurrence rate of about 30% from the Cleveland Clinic uh, experience. But if you look at the randomized trial that came out from CTSNet, it's actually much higher than that. Uh, this is a study from Japan basically showing that the more severe the tethering of the posterior leaflet, as measured by this angle, uh, the more likely the patients are to uh, come back with recurrent MR. So this is the CTSNet trial that you all know about as well. This is the one-year results that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Their primary outcome was left ventricular end systolic volume index. And when they looked at New York Heart Association classification, there was no big difference between repair versus replacement. And in end systolic uh, volume index as a marker of reverse remodeling, they also did not find any difference in these two groups of patients. Um, oh, I'm missing one thing here, but it's also, okay, so here's the survival curves that were statistically not significant, although you may see that there seems to be some benefit for mitral repair. And this is the MACE-free event rate, also uh, no statistically significant difference. The one big difference was that mitral repair patients had a 32% rate of recurrent MR at one year versus 2% in the mitral valve replacement. And when you look at the two-year outcomes that were recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's even worse for mitral valve repair. Again, no difference in survival or MACE-free survival over two years, and, but the mitral regurgitation does progress. So it was 32% at one year. It's well over 50% now at two years, uh, as uh, adequately demonstrated here. So a significant proportion of patients die after this uh, operation, and if you're going to repair the valve, a very large proportion of them will have persistent MR. Joe already mentioned this point, but I think this is the most important take-home message from that entire study, is that if you have a patient that has this basilar dyskinesis or aneurysm, <clears throat> not a typical aneurysm like we normally call it in cardiac surgery, but if you see this bulging underneath of the posterior annulus, do not repair those valves. Those patients all come back with recurrent MR. So if surgical uh, undersized annuloplasty is currently the gold standard, but we know that it's also associated with a, a significant risk of recurrence, are there ways that we can improve on this? So this is a concept that was first put forward by Bob Levine's group at Mass General, and what he realized is that when you induced a, a ischemic MR in a sheep, and then you put a patch on the outside of the heart, and you blew up the um, uh, inside of the pericardium, compressing the uh, posterior lateral wall, towards the annulus, the MR disappears. So this is a sheep model, but I know um, for those of you that were in Monaco last week and listened to Gilles Jaffa's presidential address, there's also a uh, company working on this as well for a device that gets implanted inside of the pericardium. Another way to try to address this is just simply cutting the secondary cords, which are often leading to excess tension on the leaflet. So this, as I said, is that normal uh, seagull sign. Here's a picture of a patient with a large, uh, uh, sorry, a, a cadaver heart with a large uh, secondary strut cord. And you'll oftentimes see where the secondary cord exactly inserts on the leaflet and where all that tensioning, tension is occurring. You'll see it as a dimple on the valve when you examine it. So if I see this really big uh, tethering seagull sign on the anterior leaflet, I will go ahead and cut it. I've stopped cutting the posterior uh, cords because I, they tend to be too complex. They're hard to find. They're multiple and I've been sort of disappointed in those results. But this is a paper that we presented at the AETS several years ago 
We looked at annular diameter, tenting height, tenting area, and then the distance between the posterior LV and the apex as a marker of uh, mobility of the leaflet, of the mitral valve leaflet. And then we, we found that when you added a cortical cutting procedure to the undersized annuloplasty, that you had more significant reductions in the tenting area and more mobility of the leaflet, even though it was a relatively small group of patients. And we did find also a statistically significant uh, uh, better uh, recurrent uh, MR rates uh, in the cortical cutting group and less uh, moderate MR as well. This is just a very quick video showing this technique. You see the anterior leaflet here, the posterior leaflet with this large gap at the P2, P3 level, and this is exactly where you see a regurgitant jet here. So this is, uh, without any echo, just showing this uh, quick uh, technique. You go ahead and isolate these large secondary cords, go ahead and divide them. Uh, here's the, the ones to the anterior leaflet. There's usually just two of them, one from each papillary muscle, very large, very easy to find. The posterior leaflet, more difficult to find, completely variable from patient to patient, also hard to tell if, if it's exactly a, a secondary cord or a primary cord, and therefore I just pretty well uh, stopped doing this for the posterior leaflet. But you'll see in this patient anyways, that even just after cutting the cords and not doing anything else, not adding a ring, that regurgitant jet is now gone. This is that same patient on his pre-op echo with that significant tethering uh, to the anterior leaflet. You can see that very clearly. That tethering is now gone six months post-operatively after cutting those secondary cords. And this is the uh, same patient 12 months post-operatively with good mobility of the anterior leaflet and just uh, trace MR. So in conclusion, ischemic MR is common and it's associated with decreased uh, long-term survival. It's a largely undertreated uh, problem in the cardiovascular community. Recurrent MR is a significant problem for mitral valve repair patients and cortical cutting or other subvalvular uh, interventions may uh, improve the long-term freedom from recurrent MR rates. And replacement is still uh, the best option for patients that have severe tethering, a basal aneurysm, or markedly dilated left ventricles. Thank you very much.